You're listening to the OCD Stories podcast, hosted by me, Stuart Ralph. The OCD Stories is a podcast dedicated to raising awareness and understanding around obsessive compulsive symptoms. I do this through interviewing inspired therapists, psychologists, and people who have experienced OCD. Welcome to the OCD Stories. And welcome to episode 338. And in this one, I interviewed Dr. Jordan Levy and Dr. Tatiana Mestechkina. And in it, we break down an article they wrote in the ISDF newsletter called What If This Is Not OCD? Doubting the Doubting Disease. But before that, we break down their therapy journey, why they became therapists, and specifically OCD. We discuss the idea of what if this is not OCD, and other thoughts that get in the way of therapy, such as what if this time is different? What if I'm doing therapy the wrong way? What if this is the piece of evidence that leads my therapist to think that this isn't actually OCD after all? What if these thoughts are bad and I'm a bad person for having them and letting them be there? What if my therapist doesn't know what they're talking about? So we discuss these thoughts and more and how to navigate them. We also talk about the idea of the backdoor spike and much more. Hopefully this episode resonates with many of you, which I'm sure it will do. And thank you to NoCD for supporting the podcast. NoCD offers affordable, effective and convenient therapy available in the US and outside the US. To find out more about NoCD, their therapy plans, if they currently take your insurance or to download their free app, head over to go.treatmyocd.com forward slash the OCD stories or the link will be in the episode description. So thank you to Jordan and Tatiana for their time and expertise. I deeply appreciate it. And thank you to you guys, as always, for listening. And without further ado, here they are. Welcome to the show, Tatiana and Jordan. Thank you. We're so excited to be here. Thank you for having us. Uh, It's a pleasure to have you both here. So um, as you know, what what I like to start um, the episodes with when I interview therapists or psychologists is kind of why get into therapy and and specifically why OCD? So I'll start. Uh, with with that question. So uh, I was never quite sure um, what I was going to do in life, but I always felt like I was the most rational person in the room, whether that was with my family or with my friends. Uh, I always felt like uh, I was able to look at situations um, a little differently. I was able to zoom out and that kind of gave me the initial thought that maybe this will be the the career at some point for me. Uh, and then it really wasn't until college when, uh, or as you would say, uni, uh, that I was uh, taking a lot of different types of classes and realized that, yeah, psychology is, is really uh, where I want to be. Uh, and then in, in graduate school, uh, we had a lot of different opportunities to um, try a lot of different things out. And it seemed like working with people uh, in therapy was was the most comfortable fit for me. It's where I felt the most useful. Uh, it's where I, I enjoyed what I was doing. Uh, and then I had an opportunity uh, to do an externship uh, at Steve Phillipston Center uh, in the city. And I didn't know a whole lot about OCD uh, at the time. Uh, when I went in for my interview, I couldn't tell you the difference between OCD and OCPD, which is embarrassing to admit, but you know, it is what it is. Uh, and I ended up really, uh, really loving the work. Uh, I had been working with uh, a different population prior to that. I was working with uh, patients who were um, uh, bipolar and schizophrenic and uh, that was was a lot different than the OCD work. I found the OCD work to be a lot more rewarding because even during the one year externship, you were seeing results. You were seeing people um, make significant improvements. Uh, you were seeing people um, just make tremendous progress in in a relatively short amount of time, and that was different for me. And I liked seeing how you could implement exposure and response prevention skills and somebody could run with it pretty quickly and start to feel a lot better pretty quickly. Um, So that's when I fell in love with treating 
treating OCD. And, and I always thought I was going to have a more diverse practice of treating a lot of different things. Uh, but the reality is there's such a demand for OCD therapists that 90% of, uh, of what I see in my practice. Um, and uh, that's pretty much how it's been for me um, since I, I left uh, Steve Phillipson's practice, uh, I guess about five years ago at this point. And it's very interesting. Tatiana and I were talking a couple of days ago how our careers have, have really paralleled uh, we, we both went to the same graduate school. We both worked together, uh, at Philipson's practice for many years where we learned and trained, uh, and how to, how to treat OCD. Uh, and we both, uh, started our own practices, um, independently, uh, at, at, at the same time. So it's been really, uh, really great to have that, that partnership, uh, all these years. Thank you. And Tatiana? Okay. Yeah, so I've also had a bit of a journey to, to get here. Um, I was always like the little girl who would annoy people with lots and lots of questions. I've always had like a very natural curiosity of the world and people particularly, and always wanted to understand people and connect with people. But I don't think I ever thought about psychology um, as a future career path. And then I discovered it very early on in undergrad and immediately was drawn to it. And my first career that I was really exploring seriously was clinical psychology. And then I realized like, oh, to, to become a psychologist, you need a doctor. And I'm like, who in the right mind would do that? That is not the kind of journey I want to sign up for. So in undergrad, I've explored so many other careers, but still had a foot in the door with psychology and still was always a psych major and um, worked at different labs and really was kind of drawn to that. And after exploring a lot of other options, I realized that was the one thing that I was truly like interested in. In. It didn't feel like studying for some of the classes. I felt like a genuine like interest in wanting to show up and learn about all the different aspects of it. And then I think in grad school, Jordan and I went to Hofstra University, which had a very, very strong CBT foundation. So I think through that, you know, it's definitely sold that I wanted to do cognitive behavioral therapy, that doing evidence-based practice was really, really important. And then I think also like Jordan, where I really fell in love with OCD was when we trained together at Dr. Steve Phillipson's practice, which is where we primarily work with people with OCD and related disorders. And I think it was just very, very fascinating on different levels. I think one thing that I just loved was the disorder itself and how the brain and just thinking about how the brain worked and so many of the people that we work with are able to use kind of logic and reason to deal with the majority of life's challenges. But then when it comes to OCD, it was sort of like this blind spot and no amount of logic or reasoning with the contents of the theme can get them through that. Um, so I just always thought that was like a very fascinating discrepancy. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing that really appealed to me was just really connecting with some of the patients and seeing what their journey was like. And so many people that I had worked with at that time, it took them years and decades even to understand what they're going through and to get the right diagnosis. And there's just so much kind of isolation and loneliness and confusion and shame and heartbreak and so much of their lives that they've lost simply because they just didn't know what this was. And that even knowing that other clinicians that they've even worked with kind of missed some of the signs for this, I think made me really passionate about helping bring awareness to it, um, about training other people in this kind of therapy. Um, Jordan and I also, since then, since we started our own independent practices, have also started training clinicians and expanding our practices, which has been incredibly fulfilling. And um, like Jordan said, I think some of this is for self-serving reasons. I found this to be incredibly gratifying as a therapist to be able to work in the field where, unlike some other challenges with mental health, we have come a significant way. Obviously, there's always more to discover and more to learn, but we have really kind of understood how it works and we have therapy for it that while it's incredibly difficult, but for almost everybody that I've worked with who has really been on board and really willing to do the work, they've been able to get their lives back and seeing that on a week to week basis and seeing people be able to not avoid doing some of the things that are truly important to them until 
live a bigger, richer, freer life and mm-hmm. kind of guiding them on that journey has been really, really rewarding nice. me as a therapist. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah. And I think, um, it ha- it, the work we do as therapists has to be self-gratifying to a point because it's it's real demanding emotionally uh, and with stress that if you don't love the population you work with you're gonna burn out at least that's my take on it um yeah so it's it's great that you Definitely. guys yeah find it so rewarding so um you guys recently co-wrote an article in the isdf uh, newsletter that went out a few months ago um called uh, what if this is not ocd which i'm sure is a common worry many of my listeners have had and then the, the subline of that is doubting the doubting disease about common intrusive thoughts that come up during treatment often about treatment itself um I guess, yeah, just initially a broad question. Um, what's this about and, and why write it? So initially, um, I was working with people who, who have OCD, and I noticed that they were bringing up uh, similar concerns uh, to each other. So, you know, maybe one person would bring up an idea like, uh, what if I'm, I'm doing this particular exposure the wrong way? And then I noticed a lot of other people bringing the same kind of thing up. And then somebody else would say, I feel like I'm the only one that's, that's really going through this. Uh, and then a bunch of other people would, would say the same thing as well. Uh, and what I wanted to do is take all of these particular concerns or, or these intrusive thoughts and put them all together in, in one place and take all the ones that I, that I hear the most often uh, and formulate this into one article that people could go to to see where uh, these, these stuck points are, where people are getting stuck, not just on the theme itself, but related to the therapy or, or related to the treatment itself. So initially, I put together an article that I guess was more of a, of a half-baked idea. It had some good, good bullet points in there um, and some others that you know, maybe weren't so, so great. Uh, and Tatiana came along and said, I was looking at this article and I think I could make it better. I have some ideas that I, I want let, to, let's strip down all the things that maybe are not so relevant. And then I'm going to include a bunch of my ideas so we had this really gigantic list uh, and it, th- that we had to, to pare down uh, just to get to the real, the real good stuff. And uh, we, we put together this article that has all these different uh, obsessions, as I said, related to uh, treatment itself, related to um, issues that come up during the course of treatment um, consistently. So um, what, what I find this article to be helpful for uh, are, are people who, are, who, who think that they're the only ones that are having these types of, of thoughts, because it's not just stigmatizing and feeling alone because you have a fear of murdering someone or being in the wrong relationship, but it's also uh, being uh, overly concerned, for example, that this is the, the piece of information that's uh, going to make my therapist think that I don't actually have OCD. Mm-hmm. And somebody coming in thinks they're generating that really unique creative thought all on their own and that nobody's ever generated that before. So I, I like the idea of this article so that people can, can read this and say, oh, a lot of other people obviously are going through the same thing. I guess this isn't just me. I guess I'm not so alone. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that when, you know, Jordan and I were brainstorming ideas for this article, I think we are lucky to be in this time in the OCD community where there's been so much progress in building awareness to the diagnosis and the best treatment options, thanks to your podcast, Stu, and, you know, amazing advocates out there and resources like Aaron Harvey's Native Million website and Chrissy Hodges and Kimberly Quinlan and kind of so many, so many other people who've been doing incredible work and really introducing people to this idea, both people in the community experiencing OCD and therapists. And we were trying to think of sort of where there might be some more gaps and how to take it to the next level of like, okay, so you got the diagnosis, you're doing ERP, you know, the evidence-based treatment, 
for OCD? And now that you're in it, where do people get stuck? Where do they hit um, kind of plateaus in their work? What are the types of intrusive thoughts about the therapy itself that tends to kind of either plateau them or detour them? And then when we're looking over kind of Jordan's article and brainstorming ideas, we just realize that there's so many parallels to it. And sometimes patients, you know, come in and and they're like, oh, do you have OCD? Or like, are you reading my mind? Because some of these things are so predictable, even though in the moment for them, it feels like such a unique idea. And I think, you know, the biggest part of it is also this understanding that, you know, it's OCD sometimes referred to as the doubting disease because doubt and the intolerance of uncertainty is really the core feature of it. So it's very predictable that people would have doubts about the therapy itself. Like, did my therapist really diagnose me with, with OCD? How do I know that, you know, they're not just diagnosed me with OCD because that's what they specialize in. Or if they, if I told them this one extra piece of information, this new thought, or this one thing that happened 10 years ago, maybe this wouldn't be OCD. And then a lot of like, am I doing therapy the wrong way and different variations of that? A lot of kind of what if dot, dot, dot questions seem to be the pattern through that. I think, you know, and like Jordan said, it was tough because there's so many, we had to really, really cut this down. So I'm like, we should write a book. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and even with the article, I'll, I'll add on to it. You know, uh, people are still going to question uh, everything, you know, even, even I, I'm showing them, Hey, I wrote this article that mm-hmm. says the exact question you're asking me, like, clearly this is not just you. But as we know, with OCD, it finds a way yeah. to still get in there and still torture people and, and still tell them, no, you're, you're, you're worse, you're different than everyone else, and, and your particular case has, has never been um, heard of before. Mm-hmm. So yeah, we just want to really normalize that these types of intrusive thoughts of therapy are very, very common, and people's brains tend to not be as creative as they might think in the moment. Yeah, yeah, it's spot on. Um... Yeah, I think it's important to to share these um, whether people read the article or just listen to the episode. Um, and I think you, you're right. People with OCD, the, the brains will... will. Well, I remember when I was really struggling years and years ago and I uh, was listening to OCD podcasts at the time that were around at, at that time. And, um, you know, I'd listen to a specific episode on a theme that I had that I really cared about. And... And I didn't really get the relief until I almost heard the exact thing I wanted to hear, even though the whole episode answered my question. If it wasn't, if there was the specific words I needed to hear, whatever they were for me to get that relief. And it's the same of, you know, you guys. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Jordan and Tatiana have written this article under the worry I'm having. They've given loads of detail, but yeah, they haven't, um, they've, they've missed this one little piece of information. So the grand scheme of things probably isn't important, but the mind would go, see, they're wrong. This this bit doesn't apply to my worrying. Um, yeah, so I'm glad you highlighted that. Mm-hmm, exactly. That's actually one of the first the first question in the article that we brought up is the thought of what if this time is different or what if this one is different, which is probably I would say the most common one that I see in my caseload from all the questions as well. Like even if someone's convinced that they have OCD and gone into this therapy, take the diagnosis there's always some sort of creative variation that their brain can say, well, this is a slightly different version mm-hmm. of this theme, or you felt a different way, or it came in a different context. Their brain is just very, very, very vigilant and trying to find the exceptions and the differences. And I think one of the things that we try to focus in therapy is really looking for the common denominators. And I always tell my patients, you know, as much as I love working with them, that the goal really isn't to grow old together, but really help them see the commonalities and even though we might be initially working on the treatment tools for one theme or a few themes that are happening in the now, the goal is really for them to be able to apply to these principles to whatever creative variation their brain might come up with in the future. And so that they're not sitting on the edge of their seat looking out for the next theme, but are really practicing openness to it. And even sometimes, you know, in advanced stages of therapies and challenging their brain to come up with something new and creative to give them opportunities to practice. You mentioned the next theme. And I think one of the most interesting manifestations of what if this one is different is when people have a, a theme switch and let's say they're coming in with, um, 
a pedophilia OCD and they're doing a really good job. They're working their way up the hierarchy and they're making significant improvements. And then all of a sudden they come in next week with um, a totally different uh, theme, let's say um, se sexual orientation obsessions. Uh, and they are looking back on the previous theme and saying, eh, that was BS. That's, that's not really relevant. Uh, you know, I could look at that and say, that was really stupid. I don't know why I wasted so much time, but this new theme, this is the real, this is the real deal. You know, this one, this time is different. This one is significant. And it's just because the anxiety has shifted from one theme to the other. And I've seen people then have a shift either, either to a third theme or back to the original theme. And it's, well, I thought that the, the newer theme was the real one, but no, it turns out the, uh, the OG theme that that's really the one, you know, that that's the one that's, uh, that I need to, to really investigate. So it, it's, it's so fascinating how it can uh, convince people that uh, this time really is unique, this time really is different, and this is the actionable one that, that really needs to be addressed in the moment. Yeah, exactly. That's a perfect example of some of the OCD propaganda. And I think our job is to help them kind of zoom out and see like, okay, what are the common denominators of this? Mm -hmm. The intrusiveness of the thoughts or the feelings of the images, even the sense of like urgency and desperation, the quest for certainty and wanting nothing short of certainty, the repetitive nature of it, just some kind of examples of red, red flags to look out for and kind of creating a filter system. Like, okay, if these red flags come up, then I'm going to make the choice, to roll the dice, treat it as OCD, even though I don't know for sure. Yeah, I think that's important, that roll, roll the dice. I describe it as like a leap of faith because it's scary to, to, to roll those dice mm -hmm. or take that leap. Um, so like, you, you've already mentioned a couple of them, but I thought it'd be really good to, to detail many of them on the podcast. Um, and then just kind of say in your guys' experience, anything you want to say about those particular doubts you think might be useful. So I don't know if you want to take turns doing one at a time or just freestyle it, however you want to do it. So the one that, that, that I would like to highlight, uh, Tatiana mentioned that what if this time is different tends to come up a lot with, with, uh, with her patients. Uh, what if I'm doing therapy the wrong way? Hmm. Uh, to me, that comes up so often, uh, and, and, to, and, and I think it's rooted in the idea that if I can just figure out the exact right way to do this treatment, and you see this a lot with, with many of our, our perfectionistic patients in particular, we know there's you know a high comorbidity between OCD and perfectionism, so people who are coming in with, with that perfectionistic style are trying to figure out what's, what's the formula? How do I get this to click in? And if I do this the exact right way, then I'm going to be able to get rid of it. And even though we're telling people all the time, look, OCD is a treatable condition. We know we can get it to a place where it's, it's not really going to be getting in your way. It's not going to be impairing, but we can't really cure it. We can't hold that remember in men in black the uh mm. the wand that he holds in front of people and, and and zaps their memory for for however long we can't do that in here we can't eradicate those memories we can't zap ocd away so it's really about managing it so that you're living your 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 best uh, your best possible life um so when people are are really trying to get in there and say, uh, I just want to make sure I'm not missing, uh, anything here, or, or, or I'm, uh, when I'm doing this exposure that I'm not uh, doing anything that, that might throw me off here. Uh, sometimes it's helpful to have that conversation and to lay out the, the basic parameters of what we're doing on a week to week basis with the homework, but people have to be careful not to get caught in that trap of, starting to become obsessed with the idea that they're doing the therapy the wrong way, because that can totally derail treatment. And, and for some individuals, that idea can provoke more anxiety than the, uh, the theme they're coming in with 
um, to, uh, to, to begin with. Um, so that's one that, that I think is really important for people to keep in mind that what we're doing in here is really trying to build a, a different mindset, a different way of approaching, not just intrusive thoughts, but really how you're interacting with this world. And you don't need to get so caught up in one particular word you're using. If, if you're writing down uh, something on an index card, it, it's not like the therapy is that fragile and you're going to be sent back to square one just because you, you, you made this, this one choice in this moment. It really is more about building this mindset of tolerating uncertainty. Uh, there's, there's a line in the article in this section uh, that says, the goal of the exposures isn't to stop the uncomfortable thoughts or feelings, but to change the relationship with them. So we're looking at this more, more globally. And I think it's really important for people to keep that in mind when their brain starts warning them and saying, uh, you know, maybe you're doing a good job in therapy overall. Maybe you don't have to be as concerned that you're going to run someone over today. But the fact that you uh, went for a drive for 20 minutes and you, you told uh, your, your, your therapist that you were going to do it for an hour today, you know, maybe that means it's, it's going to backfire here and it's going to keep coming back. So the threat is no longer uh, running people over. It's just doing the therapy the wrong way. And I think I definitely agree with Jordan. I think that this is a huge barrier that comes up, both because of the comorbidity with the perfectionism and rigidity, which can sometimes be a barrier to OCD therapy and sometimes can also become an independent challenge that we want to address in therapy. But even people without that personality style, I think that a lot of people get very excited initially about this kind of therapy. Like it's goal-oriented, it's structured, it's skill-based, there's homework, yay. And they really look at that structure in way too much of a rigid way. And it takes away from kind of the spirit of the therapy. And they start kind of going through like, okay, check, check, check. I've done my exposures. I've been the perfect patient. I've listened to my therapist. When is this going to go away? Which is exactly sort of the stuck point in the therapy that prevents them from moving forward because then they're still sending the message to their brain that these thoughts and feelings are bad. They're intolerable. We need to eradicate them versus the spirit of the therapy that we're trying to kind of model and practice, which is thoughts are thoughts and feelings are feelings. And we're allowed to not like them and not want them. And we're allowed to feel uncomfortable when they come up, but they're not dangerous and they're not tolerable. And that these exposures are just very kind of creative, different ways to demonstrate to the brain that these thoughts and feelings are okay, right? It's easy for, you know, Jordan and I to tell our patients like these thoughts and feelings are okay, just make room for them. But it's very, very hard to experience that because that's so counterintuitive and everything in their body and their mind is telling them, no, stop them, run away from them. Their fight or flight response is really, really activated. Um, so that's really the purpose of exposures. There's not one way, right way to do exposures. There's many, many different types and people do hierarchy. Some people do them more flexibly. I think that's also, you know, at what Jordan and I were talking about, you know, I've actually been incorporating a lot more ACT acceptance and commitment therapy into my practice as well, which supplements the exposure work very nicely. And one big core feature of ACT is flexibility and learning how to have more cognitive flexibility and how to create more separation from unhelpful thoughts, how to be more in the here and now, how to accept the things that are not in our control. And I find some of the ACT techniques particularly helpful with this stuck point in therapy as well. And that's something that's also, you know, always on my radar, like is the person going through the motions and doing this work, but still stuck on the goal of getting rid of the thoughts and feelings. And if so, we really need to kind of go back in the drawing board and make sure that we're on the same page in terms of what we're working on. Yeah. Yeah, it's a really good point. It's one I, I find quite tricky with some of my clients of really getting stuck on that. What when is this going to work instead of yeah, working on being more flexible, tolerating and accepting and making space for these uncomfortable thoughts and feelings. Because like you say, as soon as you get stuck on that goal, it's it's you're sending that uh, signal back to your brain. This is bad. 
Mm -hmm. Exactly. And then um, the other one that is a common one that we wrote about is what if this is the piece of quote unquote evidence that leads my therapist to think that this is not OCD after all, right? And these are the people who come in, maybe get excited about the diagnosis or at least resonate with it, do the therapy and then start questioning the diagnosis and go back into the archives of something that's happened or a new thought or feeling that's happened. Um, And this could be very tricky in therapy because they might start either kind of ritualizing in therapy and what that might look like is they might be avoiding telling the therapist a piece of information because they don't want their therapist to think that they're actually a danger to themselves or to other people or quote unquote bad person. And then this can also go the other direction where they might kind of engage in too much confession behaviors and share information and therapy uh, because of wanting to make sure that their that their therapist still thinks that they do have, you know, pedophilia, OCD theme and aren't actually going to be harming a child as well. So that's something as a therapist have to constantly keep on our radar and something we also recommend patients really asking themselves in the session, am I sharing this piece of information because I think it's actually like therapeutically relevant or I want some actual feedback on how to handle these types of thoughts? Or am I sharing this information because I want to make sure with 100% certainty that this isn't going to change the game plan? And, you know, I think sometimes in more advanced stages of therapy as well, patients are not even able to kind of joke about it and, you know, do like a fake shock reaction of like, oh, well, I didn't know this. Well, now I have to call child protective services. And when we're able to laugh about things like that, that's always kind of reassuring for me that we're on the same page and really being able to kind of play around with these thoughts and make fun of them. I've had a number of patients who um, have explicitly asked me if I'm going to be calling the police or, or notifying the FBI um, either b- before they're coming in or, or really in the initial stage of treatment when, when people are starting uh, to, to share some of these things that they feel are, are so terrible and so offensive and, and, and so horrendous. Uh, people, individuals with OCD will also uh, gauge our reactions as therapists. They'll, they'll share all these things and put this all out there to see like, oh, okay, is he cool with this? Like his face hasn't really changed. So I guess it's okay that I'm saying this. I guess this is not the piece of evidence that's, that's going to change everything. So I think as therapists, we also have to be on guard and, and thoughtful about why, as Tatiana said, why is this person sharing this right now? And um, what are they looking for? Yeah. And we have to really work on our poker faces. Yeah. yeah so I was going to ask you on that. Cause that's, that's a good point. Cause even if you have the, the poker face the obviously that's just potentially you guys just listening, but they could obviously read into that as a bad thing that you haven't reassured me. You haven't said, no, it's, it's perfectly normal. I hear this all the time with clients or, um, and they could read into it, but I guess, you know, so, so for me as a therapist in those first sessions, I would initially, I'd say reassure, but it's for educational purposes, right? That, that you know, this is mm-hmm. just, this is OCD, this is blah, blah, blah. And obviously if it continues, then I'm going to be like, you know, I can't answer that. Um, mm-hmm. is that kind of the way you guys approach it or something different? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, even this article that we wrote in itself could be very reassuring, like, oh, okay, other people sure. do this. This is normal as well. So that's always a tricky kind of balance, but I definitely believe at the very beginning, um, it's very important to lay a solid foundation and part of the psychoeducation might be reassuring, but as mm-hmm. we know, even that is not sustainable. And then um, throughout the therapy, you know, also trying to be explicit about it. And sometimes, you know, if I think someone is asking for reassurance or I'm picking up that this is more kind of the OCD part of their brain taking over the therapy, then we just kind of put the mirror up call them out and then we discuss it and discuss sort of how to handle that. It's, it's a necessary uh, piece in treatment. I'm just imagining somebody coming in for the first time saying, you know, I'm really worried. I'm going to chop up my family. And then I go right into it. with like, yeah, you know, what, what knife do you think you're going to use? <laughs> you know, that would be. Nobody would work on it. <laughs> <laughs> I'd have a lot of uh, one session cases. Uh, it's important to to establish uh, that that base of reality, mm-hmm. and to talk about well, what is the OCD, 
you know, like, let's, let's really talk about it um, with, with what you're presenting and talk about how these, these are just thoughts, you know, saying all these things that we don't want to say uh, a couple of sessions later, but really being able to, to talk about the actual anxiety disorder that this person is presenting with and, and outlining it. Uh, and then explicitly stating, you know, this is all really helpful for you to know, but this is going to become incredibly reassuring and unhelpful for you if we keep talking about it this way. So let's make sure that we're, we're setting that guideline uh, after you know, one or two sessions. Yeah, yeah good point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we also, you know, I always try to encourage the patient to be in the driver's seat. Like we can't force them to embrace uncertainty. They always have to be the one making that choice. So, you know, when I'm talking on my own, sometimes when I think something might be reassuring, I'll say even like reassurance alert and then go into it. Or if they ask for reassurance, you know, call them out. I'm like, this, my reassurance radar is going off and I'm going to like, make, I'm going to let you make the decision as long as we're on the same page that this is reassurance. I'm going to let you make the decision for whether you actually want me to answer that question or not. Hmm. Yeah, good point. Really good. Um, so if there, there are a couple others you guys want to share. You think that are quite, um, that come up, uh, well, either quite a lot or that do come up and not that much, but that it's important we share it today. So another one that kind of stands out to me is what if these thoughts are bad and I'm a bad person for having them and letting them be there? That is something we see a lot. And I think that's really leads to a lot of shame and loneliness and isolation again with with people experiencing this. And I think the very important thing to remember is intrusive thoughts are extremely common. Almost everyone, if not, I would venture to say everyone has intrusive thoughts. People experience, and most people even have intrusive thoughts that are similar in content that people without OCD as well have, um, with OCD have as well, but they just don't experience that sense of like urgency and kind of their amygdala firing as it's happening. And what we always tell people is a thought is just a thought, which is just a thought, which sounds like a very simple concept, but can also be very hard to learn to relate to thoughts that way and just to let them be that. And I think people um, engage in some cognitive distortions like thought action fusion, where they equate having a thought with acting on those thoughts or something called emotional reasoning, where they think that just because they thought they feel anxious or they feel fear, then that means the thought is important or true. So I think part of really this, especially at the beginning with psycho ed is really helping people see the brain as an independent system, helping them learn that we don't have control over our thoughts. If I tell you not to think about a pink bunny and I say, don't think about a pink bunny, stop thinking about a pink bunny, think about anything about a pink bunny. And no matter what, do not think about pink bunnies flying through the air. What are we going to think about? That's what I'm thinking. And just doing like, yeah, exactly. And I think the more I'm talking, usually the more vivid these images of pink bunnies come up so sometimes we'll even do like these silly little exercise to kind of demonstrate that because that really is the core foundation of the therapy that we are not responsible for these thoughts we don't wake up in the morning with a menu being like oh i'll take 10 of these thoughts one of these thoughts none of that this one i'll take in the afternoon and this one i'll have at dinner with my dessert like that's not how it works but often we intuitively believe that we are controlling thoughts and i think there's some unfortunate messages in society as well of like choose happy thoughts choose positive thinking um think positively and then people feel even worse of like well why am i not able to choose these and why are my thoughts not like that um and i kind of bring up the analogy of like judging yourself as a bad person for having these thoughts if you truly believe that they're an independent system is the same thing as me saying, I'm a horrible person because it's really hot outside today. If nobody would say that. It doesn't make sense. Um, so yeah, that's a big part of what we work on in therapy to let go of controlling thoughts, let go of judging them and let go of tr- judging ourselves for those thoughts and practicing treating ourselves with more compassion and kindness that we often is easier for us to bring to other relationships and harder to bring to ourselves. Well said. To, to speak to the universe, universality, you know, 
Yeah. I don't know. You're going to have to edit that out. What is it? The universe? Yeah, universe. Universality? Yeah, yes. I think so. Okay. The universality of uh, these thoughts. Uh, I often find that I have a similar conversation with people when they ask, what do you do for a living? And I tell them, I'm a psychologist. I specialize in, in treating OCD. And they say, oh, the, uh, the hand-washing thing. Or, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm so uh, orderly with my papers on my desk. And I'm like, well, no, not really. Um, you know, what, what we're treating is, is different. The disorder is different than what you think it is. And then I'll talk a little bit about Pure O. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the types of thoughts that people come in with. Uh, and the response is almost always, oh, I've driven around the block a couple of times after I hit a pothole or yeah, I've, I've felt very weird after a, a strange dream that I had the night before, or, you know, I, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. I didn't know that that was, was OCD and, and, and everybody, I think, as you said, really does have these intrusive thoughts. It's just with OCD, they're taken to a different level. And, and when you're introducing that tidal wave of anxiety into the picture, they get stuck. So again, it's these thoughts do not indicate anything about the goodness or badness uh, of a person here. Uh, they're re they really are just random thoughts that everybody on this planet is experiencing. It's just for three or five percent of the population. Uh, they're really getting stuck in there. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, go for it. Uh, no, I, I was just going to uh, to highlight another uh, bullet yeah, point yeah. in here. Um, one of my favorites, uh, if I could call it that, is what if my therapist doesn't know what they're talking about? Um, and I, I think that when I first started uh, hearing people ask about this, uh, as a, uh, a newbie green therapist, my first thought was, oh, obviously they're asking me this question because I'm younger and they can, they know exactly how much I know about OCD. They know that I'm not the seasoned veteran. So they're asking me, um, if I've ever seen this before, you know, because of that. And obviously that was my own insecurity starting out as a, as a therapist, but, I noticed that this has persisted for years and years, and now I can call myself a, a seasoned veteran, and people are still coming in and saying, well, are you sure you've seen this before? Are you sure you've treated these cases before? Uh, because the, the threatening idea is that uh, I don't really know what they're experiencing, or I don't really know um, what they're going through. And that means that they're not going to get the proper treatment. It's going to get worse. Um, or it could be something, uh, something different altogether. So I think trusting your therapist after you've verified them, after you've done the appropriate, um, level of research to make sure, yes, this person does specialize in treating OCD. Yes, they, they, they do uh, seem like they know what they're talking about. Once that's been established, then you do have to take that risk that maybe this person who you're, you're sharing your worst fears with might not really get it. They might be missing it, or they might not really understand exactly what you're saying, but hope for the best, take that risk, and then see the results afterwards yeah yeah good good point um and obviously the the therapeutic relationship comes into it so it could be that the, the therapist knows exactly what they're talking about but two humans do not click for whatever reason and and that that person may really some people that's okay with like this person has the knowledge and i can work with that others may really need to feel that really close bond to, to do the work um so even yeah. then but I, that's over time you, hopefully that will become more clear but that's more of a genuine worry i guess i'm bringing up than an actual ocd i mean i think that's a really really important thing like someone could be an ocd specialist and have read every book and done every training and even you know have has all the experience and some of it is the value of just really feeling connected 
as humans with your therapist and feeling like this is a safe place to move forward, right? This therapy is, it's no joke. It's really, really hard work. And sometimes it feels like the therapist is telling you just walk off the cliff right there. But I promise there's an invisible bridge that'll get you to where you want to go. And it feels like a very unnatural, scary thing to do as well. So there needs to be a lot of trust in both the therapist and also the treatment itself. And, you know, I do encourage people, especially at the beginning to therapist shop to really find someone who they feel that they connect with aside from them, just kind of being an expert in this type of uh, training. And I always tell people that no matter, you know, as much as I appreciate anyone's vote of confidence in me, I do really want them to always question the therapy in a helpful way. Like I never want anyone to do anything just because I said so, but for them to really understand why we're doing the exposures and what's the reason for it and what's the spirit of it as well. So I think that kind of level of questioning is very appropriate and helpful so that people aren't really going through the emotions, but really doing the deeper work um, that generalizes to long-term gains. But yeah, I think kind of what Jordan said was really important. This comes up a lot and eventually people have to just choose to trust the therapist and the journey to move forward. And I think also something that we wrote about is the idea of like, well, I need to know my therapist has had OCD as well. And while I think that can definitely be something as all shared human experiences that can be helpful to know someone has had lived experiences with something. I also don't think that it's necessary the same way that I think that you don't need your, you know, oncologist to have had cancer and gone through cancer treatment in order to be able to treat your cancer. Yeah. Yeah. Really really good point. Yeah. Um, Yeah, absolutely. And I I think we've got time for maybe one more. Is there one more you guys want to share? There's so much more. Yeah. (laughs) We already talked about writing a part two. Yeah. yeah. Um, anyone stand out to you, Jordan? Hmm. I think something that like the what if because I don't feel anxious, it wasn't OCD after yes. all, yeah. comes up in more kind of one. advanced parts of therapy as well. So while the goal of the therapy isn't to get rid of the feelings or to feel calm, that is sort of a dividend that often happens when people really engage through the work and had kind of many opportunities to demonstrate to their brain that these thoughts and feelings are irrelevant, that they're not, they're going to do doing the response prevention and not ritualizing after the OCD episode happens and are doing the exposure work. I've even going above and beyond to go towards some of those triggers or thoughts. Um, and eventually, you know, sometimes a trigger might come up and that alarm signal, that anxiety, that fear might not come with it, which might sound really appealing to people at the beginning, or might feel really exciting when it happens or enjoyable when it happens, even though it's something we want to enjoy, but not necessarily celebrate. Um, Then the brain can show up and have kind of a sneaky, intrusive thought about that being like, oh, see, now you're experiencing, you know, you're holding a knife and you're seeing your child and you're feeling totally calm. And you just had an image about stabbing them. Mm, the fact that you're feeling calm might mean this was an OCD after all. And your therapist did a horrible job diagnosing you and you're really a danger to your child. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is something that's sometimes called the back door spike, where you feel anxious about not feeling anxious. Right. And that's sort of like a an extra layer that brain creates. So that's also just something to watch out for, to not fall for that trap, that that's something that comes up very, very often. And then the goal in those moments is to just treat that thought as irrelevant. Yes, brain, maybe the fact that I'm not experiencing the same level of anxiety about that same trigger means I might've not had OCD after all, and I'm still committed to treating this theme as OCD anyway. Let me show you how. It's, it's just so mean. I think it's such a cruel trick <laughs> that OCD plays on people. You know, you're doing the work, you're showing up to therapy, you're, you're really giving it your all, and you're starting to feel a little bit better. Your anxiety is starting to subside. You're feeling more like yourself again. You're starting to achieve mental freedom. You're like, wow, this is great. And then OCD shows up again and is like, nope, here's Not why so that's actually really bad. And you can't enjoy this either. Uh, I, I think of it similarly to um, I've had a couple of of um, of patients who are pregnant 
who have told me that they are reassured by the nausea that they experience. So when they're not feeling nauseous, they're like, oh my God, something must be wrong. I need to call my, my doctor right now. But the presence of the nausea is, uh, you know, obviously horrendous, but uh, also validating, okay, I know that everything is okay because this is what I'm supposed to be feeling. So when that expectation is not met, OCD jumps on top of it. And as OCD, as Tatiana said, um, we call that uh, the backdoor spike. And it's just another thing that, that people have to be uh, on guard for because that can become just as torturous and just as impairing as the content of any of the themes that, that we know about. The thing that comes to my mind is, is before the backdoor spike, um, maybe a pre-door spike, if that's such a thing, <laughs> of like, um, uh, where am I going with this? Um, yeah, so so engaging in treatment in the first place of, I don't want to find out if this is an OCD, if that makes sense. So if I do ERP, and in fact, the anxiety goes and the thoughts are still there. And in fact, I'm perfectly OK with that or I desire that that for then that means it was never the OCD. And um, does that kind of make sense. Do you, yeah, do you see I think that? that could be a very scary part of starting the therapy as well for because of the possibility of that happening and the anxiety becomes sort of like reinforced in itself and re reassuring as well. So people might have a hard time moving forward in the therapy because of that stuck point. So that's absolutely, that's something that can come up. Yeah. Yeah. And I think Stu, that's a great point about uh, what if I, what if I like this uh, people have brought this up um, in relation to the groinal response mm. uh, that comes up with, with many themes with, um, with pedophilia, OCD, um, with sexuality uh, obsessions, uh, and they're saying, "But I'm having this enjoyable response that that doesn't make sense. OCD is supposed to be bad. I read online that it's chronic, and people are saying that you know this is the worst thing that's happened to them. Maybe I don't have OCD at all. Maybe this is just who I am. So obviously, that can be." really, really tough to contend with. And, and that's why we want to highlight all of these traps that we tend to see uh, people fall into consistently. Yeah, yeah, good, good points. Um, so I guess before we move on, is there, is there anything you guys wanted to say on this article before we move on? I think there's, we covered quite a few. There's still a lot to get to both that we covered in this article and ones that we haven't even as well from that Jordan and I brainstormed that just didn't make the cut. And I'm sure many, many more as well. And I think the important thing to remember is like, there's a reason why it's called the doubting disease and part of the therapy, which however your journey looks like on a week to week basis, the real core of OCD is the intolerance of uncertainty and part of the therapy is really choosing to trust, to trust your therapist, to trust their journey and to trust the journey and the therapy itself and to really move forward and be willing to make room for more of the not knowing and to watch out for brain's creativity. And I think another kind of important concept is sometimes when we're talking about this, it almost feels like the brain is like this evil monster that's trying to attack you. And I really, really don't think about it that way. And I really encourage patients not to as well. Our brain's mission is really to try to keep us safe and protect us. And they are doing so in the best way they know how. It's just sometimes they become that kind of like overzealous friend or have not the accurate sources of information about what is and isn't dangerous. And I think thinking about all these like OCD traps is not an attack, but really the brain's desperate way to try to keep you safe might help kind of decrease some of that hostility that people feel when they experience OCD and yeah. kind of be willing to drop this tug of war battle and really look at the OCD part of their brain as that like overly zealous, anxious friend versus this evil monster and learning how to kind of coexist with your brain or maybe even be friendly with your brain, even though I know that might seem like very far-fetched for some people or to even kind of thank their brains for trying to look out for them, even though the messages and the feelings are very unwanted and unhelpful. 
And I think that's the most important part. It's changing the relationship. You know, getting into the nitty gritty is really not that important. Uh, I like to tell people that when it comes to the, the themes themselves, um, I don't know if you've had this in the UK, but we have something called Mad, Mad Libs. Did you have that over there? Rings it's a bell. Story, yeah, it's these stories and they leave out yes, particular yeah, words. Okay. Uh, and I always think of OCD in, in a similar way because you're just inserting theme, inserting trigger, inserting compulsion. And it, it we, we want people try to get caught up in uh, in the content and, and caught up in the specific words. But at the end of the day, they're they're really not that important. And, and it 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 might look a little bit different, but really all of it is the same. It's the same formula. And the goal, what we're trying to do is treat all of this uh, as irrelevant um, so that you can get back to uh, being exactly who you want it to be before OCD entered the picture and and got in front of your face and told you that nothing else matters uh, until you figure this particular thing out. Yeah, really really good points. Um, And is this... um uh newsletter open access for for people or is it behind a paywall do you know i am not sure if it's on the iocdf website sometimes they post the articles on their website okay cool yeah this is the winter 2021 version of the newsletter i'm not sure if it's on the website as well but uh, i think jordan and i both have a copy of it on our individual websites uh mine is cbt for better living.com cbt for cognitive behavioral therapy for better living.com and jordan the dr jordan levy dr jordan levy.com so i'll put links to both of yours in it and i'll find where you've you've hosted it on your website and link that so people want to see the rest of the ones you you wrote down and of course i I, i've got in my head anyone's going to go to that and be like oh but my one's not there doesn't mean it's not valid it just means there's an infinite amount of possibilities and you only had a certain amount of words so um you pick up the phone and call your 20 year old versions of you what what do you tell them tatiana you want to go I'll start with this one. So I've kind of alluded to this a little bit in the introduction, but I've had a very long journey and kind of figuring out what my career path is going to be. And I think the 20 year old me spent a lot of time really ruminating and looking for certainty of finding the right career and something I'm passionate about and something that I will know for sure that I will be good at and that'll be worth it and fulfilling. And I think I got really, really stuck in a lot of those thoughts and, you know, asking for reassurance and investigating and just waiting for this aha moment. So I think what I would tell the 20 year old version of me was it's okay to not know. It's really, really okay to not know. You don't have to have it figured out right now. And just to kind of take steps forward, take one foot, put it in front of the other and really let your experiences guide you. Yeah, there's no way to know for sure, right? I mean, I feel pretty certain that I that I made a good call here in my career, but I can't prove it, right? You know, none, none of us really can. So feeling pretty confident, I think, has to always be uh, good enough. Um, for, for me, for my 20-year-old self, um, I think it would be to really look around and be uh, a lot more intentional about things. This is something that I've, I've learned over time. Um, the 20 year old, uh, version of me, um, I think had a difficult time really being wherever I was, uh, at that time. Uh, I think I was always rushing ahead, uh, to get to the next thing, to get to the, the next phase of my life, to you know, check the box and, and move on. Uh, and, uh, I, I, I wish that I had taken the time to be a lot more immersed in a conversation that I'm having, or if I'm on the college campus walking around and, and, you know, noticing all the buildings and the environment, uh, and really appreciating everything, uh, that this world has to offer. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then, uh, you've both got a billboard. Uh, what do you want written on those billboards? 
So I was actually laughing as Jordan was saying, because I promised we didn't talk about his answers to these questions <laughs> ahead of time. <laughs> and I, I kind of expected that you might ask that. So I thought about what I put on the billboard. And funny enough, it's the phrase, be here now. Hmm. And I think Jordan really summarized why. And I think that, you know, it's a little bit of a nod to mindfulness, which I know we don't talk too much about today, but it is something that I've been really resonated with and I've been really incorporating both into my practice and my clinical work, but really in my personal life. And I think so much life just passes us by when we're not in the now. And so much of unnecessary suffering happens when we get caught up in the should have, would have, could have of the past or the what ifs in the future that we miss out on what's happening right now. And I can definitely resonate uh, with what Jordan was saying about, you know, even though sometimes this is helpful, but a lot of times it's not being very kind of goal driven, really wanting to do more and accomplish more and to be everywhere and constantly focusing on the next step has, I think, led me to really miss out on soaking up and being more focused on what is happening right now all around me and keeping focus on the things that are truly important to me, not sort of going off with where my brain takes me. And I think that all of us could really benefit from that reminder of coming back to what is happening, not what was, not what could be in the future. Yeah, good point. My my billboard is going to uh, sound um, contradictory to to what to my uh, my twenty year old advice. Um, and what I would put on my billboard is keep moving. Uh, literally, uh, because I find it so frustrating when there's traffic because people are slowing down. Mm -hmm. So look at the billboard, keep driving. Don't look at the accident on the other side of the road. Just (laughs) keep going. That's my literal interpretation. But as it relates to OCD, I think the idea of continuing to be in motion is really important because a lot of people with OCD will, will let the OCD slow them down. Mm -hmm. Uh, they let it become, uh, the most important force in their life. They're making decisions, uh, based on this big life decisions. And I think it's so important to keep moving and to continue, uh, doing exposures, even though they might feel impossible in the moment, they might feel wrong, but just to keep moving through it, uh, anyway, to, Mm -hmm. to, to, to live your life, uh, as if, you don't have OCD is, is really what I encourage people to do. Um, because when you're, when you're stopping everything and you're slowed down, uh, you're going to make the OCD worse, or I mean, at the very least it's, it's, it's not going to be an effective strategy. So I think showing, uh, showing yourself, uh, that you can keep moving and persevere through this, this really challenging condition is incredibly helpful. Yeah, good and point. And interesting. I think that that billboard would have been helpful for 20-year-old me to see as well when she was feeling very stuck. Yeah. Yeah, just keep going. Nice. Well, no, I, I appreciate it. It's, it's been really interesting for me. And uh, like I said, I'll put the links in the show notes so people can check out the article too if they want to go a bit deeper into this. Um, but look, thank you so much to both of you for your time, your wisdom, and your expertise. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having us. And thank you so much for the work that you've been doing. Honestly, it's been such a game changer. So many of my patients really, really use your resources and it's helped them immensely. And I'm always kind of pointing people in the direction of some of your episodes. And it's even been great conversation pieces for therapists as well for us to get different perspectives to stay up to date on different people's ideas and started a lot of conversations and very grateful for the work that you're doing for the for you. us and for the community. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for having us. And thank you for continuing to do what you do. Thank you for listening to this week's podcast. If you enjoy the OCD Stories podcast and would like to support us with a one-time tip slash donation, please go to theocdstories.com forward slash support. All tips, no matter how large or small, are greatly appreciated. Please subscribe and rate the show wherever you listen to the podcast. And thank you to NoCD for supporting our work. If you want to find out more about NoCD, head to go.treatmyocd.com forward slash the OCD stories or click the link in the episode description. And quick disclaimer, guys, this podcast is not therapy. It is not a replacement for therapy. 
please seek treatment from a trained professional. And until we speak, take care.